so isn't it funny? I was just thinking, I'm like, it's so funny. There's like just a handful of people here. And this is like one of the most requested topics. Like everybody wants to know about farming and how to do it. And everybody wants to farm. And I would say it's the thing that is done wrong most commonly. Like it's a very basic concept and it's done wrong almost all the time. And yet something like a little sprinkle of rain can keep people from attending. So literally, just know, thank you again, just know that the difference between being successful and not being successful is mostly found in the showing up, uh, especially in the rain. And uh, as example to that, um, I went out on Saturday and showed uh, houses from Costa Mesa, Irvine, Aliso Viejo, Lake Forest, North Tustin, and a few places in between for five hours in the pouring rain, um, and I have video. Like so bad that we went inside one of the houses and it was like raining, and then it really started raining, and we literally couldn't get to the car because there was this much water in the street. Like we all were like up to our ankles, like soaking wet. So, um, and those clients aren't necessarily like shopping, like they're not gonna be homeless. They have like months to buy a home. Um, but it was a really good opportunity to get in the get in the car and get in front of them. And trust me, when you spend five hours in the rain with your clients, like you guys have like a story, right? That creates a bond. Um, so it's just rain, nobody died, right? We all lived at the end of the day. Um, and a lot of real estate agents have to sell in snow and all kinds of worse conditions around the country. So that's just my short little anecdote of don't be lazy, um, show up to class, and don't be afraid of a little bit of rain. Um, okay, farming. So number one, geographic farming. So the first thing to think about, I go right on the board. Depends. Um, first thing to do when choosing a farm, what do you guys think of this? Like I have a, I have a place in mind. I already like think I know what I want to farm. What do I do next? Um, find out what, what the type of houses you want to farm for. Okay, type of houses. Else. No guesses. You're not going to be wrong. You're just not going to be right. Um, right. Areas that you're familiar with? Oh, that, I love that answer. I'm going to farm somewhere that I know. Wrong. Um, all right. What, what else do you want to check? It right. Turnover. It sounded right. Yes, you want to find the turnover rate. So the number one most important thing to look at when you pick a farm is turnover rate. So the book, the book, would tell you that you want 6% plus. Well, guess what? There's no book uh, in Southern California. Nothing applies to us, we're weird. So in Southern California, I'm gonna say six is ideal, uh, six plus. Uh, four to six is okay. Anything under four is a hard no. Cool. So how do you do that? How do I figure out the turnover rate? Anybody? Any guesses? The title company? The guy in the purple, yeah! <laughs> Woo, all right. Purple pen, purple sweater, <laughs> farm package. All right, so ask him, yeah. So hey, I like this tract. Can you run a farm report? Can you do an analysis of the last two years? So they'll show you 2017, how many houses were sold, how many are there in the neighborhood. They'll now give you this as a percentage. 2018, same data, and you can figure it out, right? So we want a minimum of 4%. If it comes back as a 10% turnover rate, that's amazing, right? Um, you can average the two years together, right? So 2017 turnover rate might have been 12%. 2018 turnover rate might be 3%, right? So like everybody sold that one year. Like something happened, right? Sometimes that happens with new home communities. Uh, it's just spotty. Depending on what's going on in the market, you do see a big variation from year to year, from time to time. Or, in a perfect world, they match, right? So if we can go back, and you can look in the MLS too, but if you can go back in time and say, okay, there have been 7% turnover every single year for the last five years, you know that that's a very consistent number that you can play off of, okay? That's number one, what's the turnover rate? Number two, you really gotta figure out and tackle um, number of homes. So how many, how many homes am I biting off, right? And we'll get into strategy on this in a little bit. So um, 
there's really two schools of thought with number of homes. Start really, really small and get super duper focused or start really, really big and narrow, okay? So super small would be 200 to 500 homes. That would be like your neighborhood. So if you wanna farm your neighborhood, which a lot of people do, I think that's a great idea. I think number one, figure out how many homes you're gonna chunk down. Number two, figure out the turnover rate, right? Um, if, if you own your neighborhood, your small little tract or your condo complex or where, whatever it is that you live, if you own that, you can make a good living off of that. And then the other benefit is when you're driving home, you don't have to see other people's yard signs. So nothing's more annoying than driving home to your house and seeing Johnny's sign up in the yard. And you're all like, what the hell, man? This is my neighbor. Like, why are you does that right now across the street and drives yeah. me nuts. It drives you crazy, right? There's only one thing worse than that, and that's pulling into your driveway and realizing there's somebody else's sign in your own yard. It's very sad. It's very sad. That's happened. My friend Sheena did it as a prank to one of her coworkers. So just know, at any moment, you might see my sign in your yard. <laughs> um, the number three most important thing, what, other than the size of the farm, really, it's fun. Um, other than the size of the farm and the turnover rate, what do you think the third most important component is? I know someone knows this one. I know it, but I don't think you want me to touch. Come on, somebody guess. It's more fun than you guess. Selling prices, the average selling prices? Average sales price, I love that. that that's like something I'm gonna put over here. It's like another discussion. Get to that. I like that, that's a good guess. Anybody else got a good guess? No? Market share? Income. Competition. Oh, yeah. So who works there, right? So the goal here, if everyone has 20% market share or less, you find that any one person has 20% or more, pick a different farm. So the reason for that is, yes, you can go fight the neighborhood expert, you can go fight that person who's been farming in there forever, it just takes a lot of money. So in general, Yes, you can do this, but this is a very long-term approach and we generally recommend against it. What you might find as well is you might find that there is more than one person with 20% or more. So for instance, let's say, you know, Charlie Costa Mesa has 50% market share and, you know, Candy South Coast Metro has 20%, right? Now we're already at 70% market share. Going in for stealing that, pulling this out of their hands is going to be a lot more difficult than just going somewhere where they don't have a dominance. What actually is great is if you find an area where it's a whole bunch of random people. One guy did two deals, one guy did one, everybody has like a two, five, seven percent market share, something like that, and it's all chopped up. That is way ideal. Okay? All right. Um, any questions so far? So when picking a farm, yes, average sales price is a really good one to get into as well. How do you, how do you find that out, the, um, the percentage of market share? Does anyone have a guess? Does that you know? Anyone have a guess at the percentage of the market share? Can I already figure that out? Because there's always a guy in the purple shirt. Yeah. Guy in the purple shirt! Yeah, guy in the purple what shirt up, is always the answer. So um, you ask him, because he'll do your homework for you which I love it when people will do my homework for me. That's why I married my wife. Um, true story. So, uh, yes, or what you do is you figure out how many total homes there are, and you figure out how many properties that agent sold, so you pull all the sales. You figure out how many are attributed to each person, and then you just do the math. So if there were 20 sales and somebody sold 10 of them, they got 50% market share. Pretty straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, average sales price. So. Why I would add that on there, and why I think that's a good answer, is uh, you, can, you can do the activities and they're gonna produce very similar results regardless of where they are. 
So as long as you follow this criteria, you might as well pick somewhere expensive. So you can go knock on $400,000 doors, or you can knock on $4 million doors. And the people who live there both put their pants on one leg at a time. There's no difference, right? You make a lot more money on the $4 million doors than you do the $400,000 doors. Does everyone believe me? Are there anybody want to fight me on this one? Any drunk monkeys in the room? Anybody want to be like, no, John, you're wrong. wrong. I'm wrong. Like, I'm okay being wrong. No? Nobody? Generally, there's somebody in here who in the back of their head is like, I can't door knock $4 million houses. And that's okay. Like, that's okay if that's like your, you start with $1 million houses, those are pretty normal. Hell, we have like $750,000 condos. So if you just want to door knock condos because you're like scared, then great, go door knock the expensive condos. Don't go door knock the cheap condos. So this part's really important because what people will tend to do is they do what's comfortable to them. So they farm where they know, right? So they're like, oh, I grew up in this neighborhood, so I'm gonna farm here. Or I live on this street, so I'm gonna farm here. The problem with that is if you don't check this stuff, it won't matter. And the truth is, when I started farming the first time, I picked the area that I grew up in, in Irvine, in Turtle Rock, and I thought it was a really good idea. I grew up there, I knew it, I thought I'd be able to passionately sell it, and it's one big loop. So when you put your open house, I got a whole bunch of open house signs, and you can put them out in the whole neighborhood, and there's 4,000 houses in the whole area, and that way the open house signs always point the right direction because it's just a circle. Um, it sounded like a great idea, right? And I got the coolest market update, man. It was 12 pages, all the sales for the past year, aerial photography, super silky paper, man. This stuff was like butter, like the best marketing piece you've ever seen in your life. And I personally delivered and door knocked it to thousands of people and then I did quarterly updates, I did open houses, I did weekday open houses, I got a sign spinner, I had a shopping cart ad uh, in the local grocery store, and I had a cool little square in the back of the church bulletin. All true. Spent $73,000 in marketing in that first year. I made $78,000. So I had a net profit of five grand. Don't do that. Let me be the warning label for you. Like, do not do what I did, okay? Follow the plan. The plan works, okay? So that's what's not to do. What to do? Okay, so who here would like to start with a small number of homes, or who would like to start with a large number of homes? Small? Who's, raise your hand if you want small. Go, go big to go big. Go small to go big. One, two, maybe three, three. You guys want to go big to go small, right? In reverse. Okay, so go small to go big. The benefit is every dollar, every activity, everything you do is hyper-focused. So it builds on itself. So if I go take down a farm of 200 and I list two houses in there, everyone in there knows that I listed two houses in there. And then the next person I talk to in there knows that I sold two houses in there and everything builds on itself, right? When I put my open house signs up, everybody sees them, right? So there's, there's a big benefit, plus I keep my costs down. So if I only have to door knock 200 homes, I'm gonna have to print 200 flyers. I only have to have 200 conversations with my title pack, it's only this big, right? Small. Problem is, in 200 homes, I can get through that all in a day, right? I can easily go door knock a neighborhood of 200 houses in one day. So what do I do tomorrow, right? I can't go back every day, that'd be weird. I could go back maybe once a month, or maybe once every two weeks, or maybe even once a week, but that's still gonna be like a lot. Like if I'm not, like every Friday, like it's trash day, and like I'm taking my trash cans out, and like here comes John walking down the street with his flyer, like, you got any clients, bro? Like, you just, you just hang out in my neighborhood all the time? Like what's the deal, right? So it may not be enough to get you going. So if you're using other strategies, and you wanna add one little thing on, Farming a small farm and getting really, really serious and really dialed into it, I think is a great approach. If you have no business and you have no plan and you're not working five days a week on something that you're already doing, then I would recommend going large. And I'll give you the system. So who's ready for the million dollar secret farming system? These, these steps to success. Literally the keys to the castle are in this bed. Okay. So you start with 4,000 houses. So. 
So this farm system is courtesy of Mr. Will May Hoy. He is an agent on the Real Beach Living team out of the Huntington Beach office. He will gladly allow you to shadow him while he executes this system. His availability is every single day between one and four. Because he door knocks every single day between one and four. Unless it's pouring rain. But sometimes he even gets it in there. Okay, so what does he do? They start with 4,000 homes. These will obviously cross into different tracts. This could technically cross into different cities. You can make the number bigger. It could be 6,000, it could be 2,000. I like his system, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't mess with it. You don't have to use all of this when you're using this system. It helps if you do. So if you can have a higher turnover rate for all 4,000, God bless you, right? Just remember, you're going big, so the data might not stack up the same way as this. This, I doubt anyone has a high, high, high market share spread across that many homes unless you happen to just be going after someone, one particular agent's giant farm, right? If there's already one agent that's dominating 4,000 homes, stay away. Like, that is a bad place to market, okay? 4,000 homes, so what do you do? So we door knock them. And we do this for three hours, five days a week. Each hour, knock on 50 homes. That's 150 per day, not including bold 100s. So occasionally to spice things up, Will will do what's called a bold 100, which means you talk to 100 people in one day about real estate. In order to hit 100 conversations at the door, it takes seven hours. Okay. So 150 knocks a day will yield you 20 to 30 real estate conversations, most likely. Of those 20 to 30 convos, you will get probably two to three of what we would call leads. What you are looking for in this system when you knock is you are looking for hand raisers. So do you want to do the Wednesday too? Who wants the script? Alright, knock, knock, knock. Someone answered. Hi, my name is John Pugh. I'm with Keller Williams. I'm just really curious. Do you know anybody out here who's um, looking to make a move, move into the area? Um, yeah. You know somebody? Yeah. Awesome. There's a house for sale in the neighborhood. What's their number? It's 310 8952. And their name is? Nico. Awesome. I'll give them a call. Great. Thanks. Okay, that was easy. Okay? So, first question Do you know anyone who wants to buy a house in this neighborhood? They're going to say no. If they say yes, you do what I just did. Great, what's their number? What's their name? That was easy. You just gave me the set, right? You know anybody? All right, so now say no. So do you know anybody looking to buy a house in this neighborhood? No, actually, no. Yeah, no, I figured you didn't. Um, anyway, I'm just curious. Um, how long have you lived here? About 20 years. 20 years, cool. So when I find a buyer for this property, what are some things I can tell them that you love about the neighborhood? It's a safe neighborhood. It's a great place. Just curious. Uh, uh, they're asking like 900000 If I brought an offer to you, like let's say that my clients don't like that property, would you consider an offer around that price? Uh, depending on what the market value is. So. Sure, okay. So so you would look at an offer if we brought you one? Why not? Okay, cool. Keep the options open. Awesome. So hand raising, right? So I'm really just trying to get to the door. They open the door, and I ask them a couple of very simple questions. Um, number one, do you know anyone who wants to move into the neighborhood? Number two, would you sell your house? Are you interested in selling? Are you moving? If you want to go further, you can say, where would you go if you moved? Oh, I'd go to Florida. When would you go? When my kids graduate. Whatever that is, right? You're just trying to get three or four very simple pieces of information. Um, and occasionally they'll be like, yeah, actually, that's so weird. I was thinking of selling. So if they say, yes, I was thinking of selling, just set the appointment right there. Great. Well, I've got about 100 more doors to knock on. And, and by the way, you know that I'm proactive because that's how we met. I just knocked on your door, so you know I'm proactive for my clients. And what we do is we specialize in finding properties uh, or finding deals before they hit the market. So I work proactively for my buyers and I work proactively for my sellers. And the proof is in the pudding, I'm standing right here. So can I come over? 
later tonight or tomorrow or Saturday to go over everything that we do for our clients. And then they say yes, and then you set the appointment right there, right? So that's number one. So if possible, put that over here. So set the appointment at the site, right? If you can. If you can't, you're looking for hand raisers. So what hand raisers are is they go on what's called our uh, nurture list. Okay? Nurture list will become about 150 to 180 people at any given time. Because people will be dropping off of it and people will be added onto it. So your list, if you follow this system, you'll have about 150 to 180 nurturers at any given time. When you have the nurturers, you have to go back to these people. Every two weeks. So that becomes what you do. So some days, you're just knocking on, you're just trying to knock out the 4,000. And you go through these guys four times a year. So you door knock the 4,000 four times a year, and then you door knock your nurturers every two weeks. What this does is this takes a 4% turnover rate, and this, this targeted list turns in to about a 20% turnover rate, because you found the motivation. So on your nurture list, you've got people who were 100% certain yesterday that they were going to list with the local expert. Their friend is an agent. Um, they, they have somebody who farms in the neighborhood. Their next door neighbor is an agent. Whatever it is, there is someone they've already in their mind committed to. And yet, if you ask them a direct question, they're going to answer you, which is, are you thinking of moving in the next 18 to 24 months? And they say yes. You say, great, I'll be back. You come back every two weeks whether they're home or not. If they're home, you deepen that relationship. You have another conversation with them. If they're not, you leave your leaf behind. This usually takes people in process somewhere between six to 18 months to move for your pipeline, right? So the farming is always a long-term plan. So if you have six to 18 months of this, so Nico, Math Wizard, how many times, if I go back every two weeks for six months, how many times have I been at that door? 12 minutes. 12 times. So if I meet you 12 times over the course of six months or I drop something on your door, you're gonna think that I am lazy or consistent? Consistent. Consistent, right? So eventually what people do is they say, you know what, I was never gonna list with this kid. Stupid kid, fall at the door, knocks on my door. His dad never sold the house, looks like he's 12. After six months, you're like, this kid's gonna hustle, man. I gotta interview him. I at least have to interview him. I'm still gonna list with, you know, Rick the neighbor, but I have to meet with this guy. When you sit down and talk to him, then you'll be able to close him. So consistency is key. Do not start this if you are not going to follow it to a T, okay? You have to have a flyer, you have to have a leaf behind it. The key, it does not have to be special. It should always look the same. So you need a flyer. She really only have three things on it, or it really only needs three things. And Will will give you a copy of this flyer. Um, I can get it for you. It's really basic. It just, it's on blue paper. They went to the store and they bought the blue paper, not the yellow or the pink or the white. Look, pick your color, it doesn't matter. Do it on colored paper, that way you don't have to print in color, but it's still color. A color will also give you consistency over time when you come back every two weeks. we like, damn, blue sheet of paper's here again. Blue sheet of paper, blue sheet of paper. Crumple up, trash, crumple up, trash, crumple up, trash, pick up, call, list, right? So they, that's the whole point, it's just repetition. Um, they put all of their past sales on the back. Maybe they cut it off after like a year or two. They don't put the date. They just put do, 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 do. So when you turn the flyer over, it just says recent sales, and then it's brrr. Of right? um, the agent or the team, right? Correct, agent or team, or brokerage. Just come to Anita and say, hey, can I put the last 20 sales, 
if I don't put the street address, if I just put the street name and the price. So all I have to do is put, one, you know, Shady Lane, 4.2 million, you know, whatever. Boom, 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 boom. You can put the city if it helps you, or don't put the city. This is the best part. Shady Lane, three million. Main Street, two million. Do, 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 do. People, like, they don't know where these properties are, and it doesn't matter, right? So that makes you look like you've sold houses before. Cool. On the front, something very simple, either a just listed, a just sold of your own, or uh, some, maybe some information about Prop 6090, which allows owners to transfer their tax bases, because you've got a lot of old people with a lot of equity and, the, and low property taxes. So if they don't figure out how to keep their low property taxes, they're unlikely to move, right? Tips on downsizing, tips on staging, preparing your home for sale, whatever it is, right? Just come up with a very simple flyer. It doesn't really matter. You could even go on Keller Williams Referral Network and find agents in like Arizona, Las Vegas, Florida, wherever, right? The, the area is San Diego, uh, Palm Springs, right? Go get four listings that are for sale right now in other geographies where people are likely to relocate to and then put those on there. I get their permission to advertise those listings and go door knock and say, hey, here's some properties that you might consider buying if you're thinking about moving out of the area. There you go. Simple, right? Now you start, they're like, wow, I can get this super cool place in Arizona for like 200,000 and I don't need this big house and blah, 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 right? Or if they want to stay in California, oh, I didn't know I could transfer my tax basis and buy a property in Palm Springs and you know, pocket that money and, and live out there for 300,000, whatever the, the conversation is, right? Okay. Um, the other thing I would put on there if I were going door to door is somewhere on there I would put a little um, calculator, a little table, that shows if your rent is X, you could afford a home X. So if your rent is 2,500, you can afford a house that costs 700,000, whatever that translation is, because you're gonna run into renters and you shouldn't just skip the renters. Because if you get the renters to move, then you get a sale if you get them to buy with you. And you can contact their landlord and offer to sell the property. Because anytime a tenant vacates, the owner has to decide, do I get a new tenant or do I sell? So you can create a sale that way. So I would definitely have something for the renters, and then also know that you're likely to run into real estate agents. So don't forget, with the power of Keller Williams and profit share, if you run into a real estate agent, that doesn't mean, oh sorry, I'll go away now. By the way, I'm farming your neighborhood. Um, it can mean, Oh, awesome, nice to meet you. How long have you lived here? Do you work the area? Oh, you're a commercial agent, awesome. Do you love working where you work? No, I don't. Okay, cool, well, I love Mark, he's our team leader, he's amazing, I'll have him call you, right? So you can very easily spin it in to somebody that can join Keller Williams and add your profit share as well. 